Okay, so we've been looking at uh, the subject of eschatology for the last several weeks. We looked at, uh, examined what eschatology is. It simply means a study of end times. We looked at some of the significant events that are going to take place that the Bible prophesies of during the end times, one being the Gog Magog invasion of Israel, which would be the next major conflict to be looking for, either that or the rapture of the church. We don't know which would come first, but this Gog Magog invasion of Israel, this battle that takes place between Israel and principally Russia, Iran, and Turkey uh, would not be Armageddon. Armageddon is a separate battle completely. But we see that the, everything's forming to actually allow that to come about, isn't it? You see that this past week, Putin and the leader of Iran and the leader of Turkey all came together for a conference. They're, they're developing more and more of a military alliance. We can see the necessity or the need, the hook in the jaw that would cause Russia to want to come down to, to control Israel and control that part of the world because of the gas and the oil reserves that they would like to take control of. And so that's a very exciting aspect for us. We see that uh, as the world events are taking place, uh, the globalists, and we look at the China and what the Chinese would like to do in their desire for global domination, but we also see what's taking place among the elitists in the West and those who would like to take uh, charge of the globe. They, they would actually like to be able to put in the same policies in effect globally that China does in, in China. Remember we talked about some of those. Remember which some of the the policies that they put in place that the elitists would like to put in place over us? Surveillance. Surveillance. The Chinese people are the most surveilled people in the face of the earth, right? The Chinese are under surveillance constantly. The CCP, the Communist Party of China, knows exactly what everyone is doing at every significant moment in time. And the same thing is true here. They would like to put us under surveillance. What else? Social credit scores. What does that mean, social credit score? Yeah, how compliant you are as a citizen of the New World Order. Are you compliant with the green new <laughs> agenda that they have? Are you compliant with the progressivism of the day? And China scores their people, and based upon the score, determines how well you can function in a society. What else? What other things do we mention? Give away their guns? They're, they're defenseless. China has taken away the guns. Europe has taken away the guns of their citizens, and they would depress progressives and elitists here would certainly like to take away our ability to defend ourselves, wouldn't we? Wouldn't they? What else? Yeah. Yeah. CBDC? What's CBDC coming to a town near you? It's the central bank digital currency. What that means is that they would like to do away with paper money, the government, the United States government, would like to take control completely of all of the finances of the United States and all of us and our citizenry. Take care of, take control of your 401k. We saw, uh, actually, that's what takes place in China right now. China controls all of the finances of the, of the nation and the populace. Uh, what happened when the truckers began to revolt in Canada? What did they do there? Yeah, what you said. <laughs> Trudeau uh, said it was a case of an emergency, national emergency, and so they took control of all of their finances. They froze their assets. They stole their money. Uh, they would like to do the same thing here. So as you see more and more talk about a central bank and a digital currency that they're pushing forth, so they get away with, with paper money and supposedly to cut down on crime, but the real issue and the real desire is control. And they, will, and they can control your resources, they control your finances, they can control you. So we see that's what's taking place. And so everything that China is doing in order to be able to maintain absolute control over its population is exactly what the elitists would like to do here in the West, not just in the United States, but Europe as well. And so we know that the Bible predicts that there would become a one world leader. There would become a one world religious system. We know that there will be a church that functions after the rapture. Unfortunately, it's the apostate church. It's not a true church. We know that there will be a one world religion, a one world economy, a one world health system system, a one world governmental system, all controlled by what man? The Antichrist, the man of sin. You know, isn't that interesting? Hmm? As Satan offered the world, remember that temptation, right? He said, all of the kingdoms of this world I'll give you if you'll just bow down and worship me. And Jesus wouldn't fall for that, would he? No, nor would we. But this man will. 
He'll bow down and worship Satan for the sake of that power and for being able to control the empires and the nations of this world very short term. But until that day, we can watch what's taking place with excitement, knowing that our redemption draws nigh. Look to the eastern sky, because he's coming soon. And so we've been looking at all of the texts that indicate that. We looked at the uh, types in the Old Testament of the rapture. We looked at Enoch, and we looked at Noah and his sons, what had taken place there. We looked at Elijah and Elisha. We looked at Daniel and his three amigos. We looked at Joshua when he took the city of Jericho. And then we began to look at all of the warnings in the New Testament that are given, and particularly Jesus gave many of them that as believers, we're held responsible to watch, to know, therefore, the time and the season not to be caught unaware because for most he would come as a thief in the night thief in the night totally unexpected hmm? now just as I pointed to in Luke uh, chapter 18 19 when Jesus makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem he holds Israel accountable for not knowing the day of their visitation they should have known this is thy day the day that makes for your peace your reconciliation with God because of your sinfulness and why would they have known? Who prophesied that day? Daniel. Daniel, the prophet, right to the very day. And Daniel, the prophet, was given the privilege to prophesy the second coming of Jesus to the very day when he actually steps foot on planet Earth. We said that the second coming of Jesus is in two phases. The first time he comes for the church to take us out. The second time he comes with the church to establish his millennial, his kingdom, his millennial reign. And so we looked at some of those uh, warnings last week. We looked at the parable of the fig tree. Um, uh, let's look at uh, some specific prophecies with regard to the, the rapture of the church. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's amazing how Paul only spent about three weeks in Thessalonica, and, and yet he got so deep into the word with them and, and the study of eschatology and times, because First and Second Thessalonians are very apocalyptic. But if you look at chapter four of First Thessalonians, most commonly understood uh, text with regard to the rapture of the church, verse thirteen. Everybody there? First Thessalonians chapter four, verse thirteen. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who've died, who are believers. Least you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So those who died in faith, believing in Jesus, they're going to be coming with Jesus, aren't they? For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who've died. No, it's not that we're going to get there ahead of them. It appears that we all get there about the same time, <laughs> interestingly enough. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That word harpazo is where they get the word rapturo in the Latin Vulgate, right? And that's where they get the word rapture, the English word rapture. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with the, those who, who predeceased us and are in Christ, with them to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall be with the Lord always, always, always and forever. Won't that be wonderful? Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And then, you know, we looked at when Joshua took Jericho. Remember the symbolism there? The type? As Joshua was going to take the, the city of Jericho represented what? Metaphorically. The world, the world, so powerful, so mighty, you know, uh, impenetrable, right? The, the walls of Jericho. I mean, you know, who could conquer over Jericho? And what did God tell Joshua to do? This is the battle plan, Joshua. This is what I want you to do. I want you to march around the city. And as you march around the city, blow the trumpets. And what did the residents of Jericho do as they were on the wall watching all those warriors from Jericho? laughing, mocking them, ridiculing them. What, what, what are you attempting to do? Scare us with your trumpets? <laughs> and then Jesus, or the Lord told Joshua, on the last day, you'll march around seven times and then blow the trumpets with a great sound. And so there's this great sound of the trumpets and then the shout of the people. And what happened? 
The walls came tumbling down, and what does the text tell us? Every man went straight up before the other. Almost the type of the rapture, you know? We see the, the same kind of a verbiage here, but Paul is very explicit where that was implicit, implying the rapture. This is explicit. In, it, it is actually saying this is precisely what's going to happen. We're going to hear the, a great shout from the Lord. We're going to hear a trumpet. And then we're going to be caught up. Isn't it unusual, these strange sounds that people are hearing all over the globe, these trumpet sounds. It sounds like a trumpet. Have you heard any of those or seen any of those YouTube videos? No? It's really strange. People will record these sounds, and it sounds like a huge trumpet being blown. And no one has any idea where these, these noises are coming from. Well, I know what it is. It's the angels rehearsing. <laughs> Getting ready. But I want to pay particular attention now to chapter 5 in 1 Thessalonians concerning the day of the Lord. Now, the day of the Lord begins with what? The rapture of the church. And when does the day of the Lord end? At the end of the millennial reign of Christ. It's a long day. It's over a thousand years, right? So it begins with the rapture of the church. It ends at the end of the millennial reign of Christ where he establishes a new heaven and a new earth and he reigns and we reign with him as kings and priests unto our God forever and ever and ever. Can you imagine? No, we can't. But chapter 5, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you for you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord still comes as a thief in the night. What? A thief in the night for whom? For those who are unaware, for unbelievers and those believers who are asleep spiritually, not attentive to what's taking place, caught up with the cares of this world. For when they say peace and safety, who will say peace and safety? Now we know from other prophetic texts, Israel will say peace and safety. Israel. Does Israel feel peace and safety now? No, 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 no. What's going to have to happen very, very soon? If the Israelis, uh, if, as a nation, they're going to survive, what are they going to have to do very, very soon? Take out, Iran. Take out Iran's nuclear capability. They're going, to, they're going to have to make a preemptive strike because we have an idiot in the White House. I pray, pray for the idiot, but I pray for him. But he's an idiot nonetheless. And he wants to bring about this uh, Iranian deal, allowing them to, to actually be able to formulate a nuclear weapon. He wants to bring about a two-state solution. Uh, you know, if, if you uh, know anything about his visit to Israel just recently, when he left Israel and went into Palestine, what did he do? That was so significant. It was such a... What else did he do? He removed the Israeli flag off of his car and put the Palestinian flag on. And in that part of the world, that was very, very symbolic, you see. He's, he's really an anti-Semite. Make no mistake about it, irrespective of his, his verbiage, you know, the claims he makes. Iran's a couple of weeks away from having a bomb. Israel can't afford that. They just can't. Even, even the liberals in Israel know it would be suicide. And so Israel's going to have to take action. There is no peace. There's no safety right now. But there's coming a day when there will be peace and safety. Now, how will that take place? When will that come about? I, I believe it will come about as a result of the aftermath of the Gog Magog invasion. What's going to take place is the phoenix is going to rise from the ashes of that, that conflict. And who will the phoenix be? The Antichrist. The Antichrist. He is the one who comes about and brings a diplomatic solution to that part of the world, which there has been no peace for, for hundreds of years now. But he's going to bring a false peace where he's going to allow the three monotheistic religions or faiths to worship there, because that's really what's being contested, where the, the Muslims will have it when? Friday. Who will have it on Saturday? And who's going to have it on Sunday? The apostate church, thank you very much. The apostate church, not, not Christians, apostate church, okay? But nonetheless, he'll bring about that peace, and then they'll think, peace and safety, peace and safety. How long will that last? Three and a half years, the Bible predicts. Three and a half years of peace and safety. So that's what you're referring to here. And when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as birth pangs upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, you, brother, now he's talking to us. Believers, you are not in the darkness, so that day should overtake you as a thief. 
So no believer should ever be caught unaware of what's taking place. They should be able to discern the signs, plural, of the time singer that we're in right now. You are all sons of the light, sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on a breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. The hope is a certainty, right? It's not a maybe. It's not a wish. This hope is a certainty of the salvation. What salvation is this? This is the salvation or the rescue from the tribulation that's coming upon this world. That's what he talked about. Remember, we looked at the text in... Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, he will appear a second time, Jesus, but apart from sin unto salvation, not because of the sin problem. He's dealt with that the first coming, hasn't he? But what does he come the second time for? What salvation is that? What rescue is that? To rescue believers, true believers, from the tribulation that's coming upon this world. As he rescued Noah and his sons from the tribulation. As he rescued Daniel's three amigos from the tribulation of the fiery furnace, etc., etc. That's what he's referring to here. For God did not, verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath. Now, whose wrath is he talking about specifically? His wrath. His, God's wrath. He's talking about God's wrath. God did not appoint us to his wrath. We may suffer the wrath of Satan. We may suffer the wrath of, of, of unbelievers who are persecuting the church. And never before has the society in which we live been more hostile to the things that we hold dear, to our faith. Even the government, all of the institutions that we used to cherish and respect, they're hostile towards what we believe as Christians, hostile towards the Jew. It's amazing. So the salvation he's talking about here is to be rescued from the tribulation of that day. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to appoint salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you are doing. So there's the proof text of the rapture. Uh, any questions on that? We should not slumber or sleep. What does that make you think about? I'm sorry? Being lethargic, right? Do we have a text that talks about that? The Lord coming as a thief in the night? People slumbering and sleeping? How about the parable of the ten virgins? Let's go there. The parable of the ten virgins. That's found in Matthew 25. Go there. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Who gave this parable? Who gave this parable? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Now, there's one thing you need to understand about parabolic literature. I heard one teacher say that you should never even try to interpret the parables until you had about 30 years' worth of experience. Got I got that, but I'm still, I, <laughs> I, I still don't feel adequately equipped because parabolic literature is the most difficult literature to interpret. Okay? Uh, when you, if you really want to try to be very, very specific and succinct in, in the interpretation. Now, you can make some general interpretations that are wise, but, but that's all it is. It's general. So in the parable of the ten virgins, most theologians will agree, most Bible interpreters and scholars will agree that what they're speaking of, the ten virgins, are speaking of whom? Who? Who? Who are they speaking of? The church. They're speaking of the church. I, I have a number of commentaries on my desk, in my office at home, and all of them say the same thing. They all, they all believe that the, the, this parable represents the church. So if it does, well, we'll consider it that way. But you're free to interpret it any way you see the Lord leading you. Verse 20, chapter 25, verse 1, Then the kingdom of heaven is likened unto ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Who would be the occupants of the kingdom of heaven? Who are the residents of the kingdom of heaven? The church, believers, okay. Now, five of them are, were wise and five were foolish. So he's comparing the wise and the foolish. For those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So, you know, what they would do in a lot of cases in those days when they travel, they would have their lamp and they would have oil in the lamp and they would have their lamp lit so they could traverse the evening. Uh, but they'd also have another vessel with a reserve of oil. 
as they were running out to replenish that supply of oil in their lamp. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Now, we can all be guilty of spiritual lethargy, can't we, at times, of being slothful. One thing I want to try to commit myself to this year is just to be more industrious in enriching and developing my own spiritual life, you know, my own spiritual man. Um, slothfulness and laziness is, should never exist in the life of the believer. And that's what he's talking about here. But they, but they all slept. I think about uh, Peter, James, and John, you know, the, the inner circle, right? Jesus had the multitude. He had the 70. He had the 12. But he had the three, too, didn't he? And those three saw things that nobody else had seen the Lord perform. What were some of the things they saw that no one else had seen? The transfiguration. What else? The rising of the little girl, Talithakume, little girl, arise. She's, she raised from the dead. They saw that. The others didn't see that. And so we know that, that Peter, James, and John were given special privileges uh, uh, that, that the others did not have. But even them, remember at the night of the transfiguration, what took place? They all slept. They all slumbered and slept, right? They wouldn't watch with him for one hour to pray. And I can't even imagine what they must have missed in the conversation that was taking place between Moses and Elijah and Jesus, you know? What do you think they were talking about, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus? Moses, Moses represented? Elijah, Elijah represented? Prophets. The prophets. Jesus, the Messiah. And so all that the law represented in type Jesus was in in reality, all that the prophets had declared with regard to the coming of the Messiah was fulfilled in Jesus. I, I think that that's what they were talking about. And they were amazed and seeing that the realization of all of these things being fulfilled in, in the person of Jesus Christ. But the disciples were slumbering, sleeping. They missed it all. How much do we miss when we're sleeping and slumbering spiritually? Hmm. Yeah. We <laughs> I think that's why it keeps me up so much at night. <laughs> But at midnight, verse 6, at midnight the cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Do you hear it? you hear the Holy Spirit crying out now, even now? The bridegroom cometh. The bridegroom cometh. I keep hearing that. Don't you? Yeah, it's true. And the Holy Spirit is. Who's the best friend of Jesus? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We don't know his name. We know he's the Holy Spirit. Ruach HaGodesh, right? the Holy Spirit, but, but we don't, we're not given his name purposefully. Why? Like the servant of Abraham who goes to seek a bride for his son Isaac. Remember? He goes back to Ere the Chaldees where Abraham came from to get a bride for his son Isaac from his own people. And as he goes, he never tells anyone who he is. But we know who it was. Who was it? Eliezer, the chief servant of Abraham. But he never reveals his name. All he talks about, all he keeps witnessing of was what? His master's son, Isaac. My master's son, my master's son. And he's a type of the Holy Spirit who never mentions his name. But the Holy Spirit came to bear witness of Jesus. The best friend of Jesus hmm? is the Holy Spirit. The bridegroom cometh, the bridegroom cometh. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Excuse me, let's go back to where we were. Um, <clears throat> verse 6, And at midnight the cry came out, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out and meet him. Then all of those virgins arose, they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, least there should be not enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. But while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in, with him to the wedding and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins also came saying Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and he said, Assuredly I say to you, I do not know you. And what's the warning? Verse 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So we need to have a constant expectation of the Lord's return at any moment. And so that our life needs to be in a state of readiness or preparedness. We can't be slothful. Now, the time to prepare is not when he comes. The time to prepare is now. And how do we prepare? Hmm? 
be in the Word, be in prayer. But those disciplines of prayer and in the Word can become just rote acts of duty rather than acts of devotion motivated by love. You see, the preparedness that we need is to make sure as we sang, Lord, I love you, right? I give you my heart. Lord, I love you. I need you, you know? And so the preparedness is continually giving him more and more of our life, more and more of our heart, more and more of our devotion. Not duty, although it's okay. It's okay to read. It's okay to pray. It's okay to go through those spiritual disciplines sometimes when you don't feel like it and you do it out of duty. But more often than not, you should be doing it out of devotion because of your love for the Lord and appreciation and gratitude for all that he has done for us. And, and if you want a greater appreciation, please continue to look at Jesus. Read John's gospel. John emphasizes the person and the work of Jesus more than the other f f three. And you see the majesty and the love, the compassion, the mercy and the grace of Jesus. I'm sorry? Carolyn? We can also sing his praises. We can sing his praises. Yeah. I love this song, uh, So Precious is Jesus, my Savior. Yeah. I, uh, I, I sing all the time. I, I break out in song all the time. I'm reading the Bible and in certain verses, and I just start singing. And she says, well, well you know, we, you have to sing. Can we just read, you know? But, but I, I do. I just, and I, like, I, I express my love for him in song and in, in singing, you know? Uh, but that's what we're talking about, the preparation to be ready, is that he is the master passion of your life. He's number one. Above any other possession or any other relationship or any position you could have, any, any other desire in life has to be far, far in the rears, in the shadows, as opposed to your relationship to him. Unfortunately, that's not the case with most. Okay, so we looked at uh, Thessalonians. We looked at the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, let's look at 2 Timothy 4.8 for a minute. Paul is writing to this young pastor whom he loves dearly, his one true son. Second Timothy chapter 4. Is that what I said? Oh, that's first Timothy. Oh, second Timothy. Paul is singing his swan song here. Why do I say that? What's a swan song? Yeah, a song. Uh, the, it's interesting, these creatures, this uh, swans, before they die, they'll, they know the time of their death. Before they die, they, they sing out this beautiful song before they expire. But this is Paul's swan song. It begins at verse 6, actually. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, a libation unto God. A, a drink offering was a libation that you offered to the Lord. You remember when, uh, when David was thirsting and he wanted a drink from the well of Bethlehem, and his, one of his mighty men, or a couple of his mighty men, actually went down, risked their own life, and got some water from that well for David. And they brought it to him. Remember what he did with it? He poured it on the ground as a libation to God. He couldn't believe that these men were willing to sacrifice their life to bring him this drink of water. And he said, how could I possibly consume this? This is precious. This is sacred. And he poured it out to the Lord. And so what Paul is saying is that his life is being poured out like a libation, a sacrifice unto God. And, and you see, that's the other thing. We know if we're prepared and we're ready is our, is our life is being expended. Our life is being exhausted. Our life is being poured out for the purposes of God. I want God to use me more than he ever has in my life, and I want to finish well. I want the end of my life to be far more busy and more useful for God than it ever was at the beginning. Isn't that what you desire? Yeah. I would like to drop dead right here <laughs> as I'm teaching the word or sharing the word one day. Just suddenly go, you know, like Enoch. Right? Walk with God and no more. <laughs> but anyway, Paul says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. Is it an issue? He knew. He knew he was going to be going on to be with the Lord. For I have fought a good fight. There's a good fight to fight, right? Yes. 
But our weapons are not carnal. They're mighty through God for the pulling down of these strongholds. Our weapons are spiritual, not physical. Don't get caught up with some of the craziness that's going on today, you know. Uh, there was one Bible teacher who was an excellent, excellent Bible teacher, but he was really caught up in the militia. Uh, he even moved out into the Mecca where the uh, militia men were, and he was a general in that whole thing, and well, he really got off balance, you know. Uh, you got to be very careful. God never told, Jesus never told his disciples to take up arms and fight the Romans, did he? No. The real battle that we have to fight, and the real enemy is where? Within. Within. Yeah. If, if I'm as Christ-like as I can possibly, possibly be, then, then I can do battle everywhere else, right? But the real battle is within. Hmm? But he said, I have fought the good fight, and he certainly did, didn't he? I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, one of the five crowns that a believer is given in his lifetime, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, on the day he goes to be with the Lord, he's going to receive that crown of the righteousness of Christ. And, and not to me only, but also to all who lo have loved his appearing. Who's appearing? Jesus is appearing. So what's Paul talking about? What appearing? He's talking about the second coming. What else is he talking about? He, I, think he's, I think it's a double entendre. I think it's a dual meaning here. Appearing in your life. Don't you love it when, when you act so contrary to your nature? Don't you love it when your reaction to something that takes place is so Christ-like and it's not you at all? You know, that's, that's loving his appearing, right? And, and when, you, when you see that happening in your life, and you're like, this is not me, this is not natural, this is, this is the Lord, you know. It's such a beautiful thing to know that he's at work in your life. And then the love also, the love is appearing. We, we long for his coming, don't we? Everyone we talk to at the table, we, and that's the nice thing about going to the cove is you have all of these meals, and you sit at a different table with a different group of people each time, and you have these great conversations, but everybody, at the, everybody longing for his coming. Is appearing. Hmm. Let, let's look at a type in the uh, New Testament. Go to Matthew 17. Go to Matthew 16, 28. We'll start there. And this is what we talked about a moment ago, the transfiguration. Why is the transfiguration a type of the rapture? I'll turn to chapter 16 and 17 and we'll find out. Chapter 16, verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not tell, taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So who was he talking about? Who would not taste death till they saw the Lord coming in his glory? Peter, James, and John, because they're going to see the Lord transfigured. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. That's how we know there was just the three of them. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light, as the light. What had taken place? What had happened? Jesus received his glory, right? He has put aside, he didn't, he didn't remove his glory, but he put aside his glory when he came in the form of a man, right? In his incarnation. But now they see him in all of his glory, when John sees him at the apocalypse and the revelation, the apocalypse is simply the revelation of Jesus Christ in all of his glory. John was the one who at that last Passover was so comfortable with the Lord, he put his head right on his breast. Can you imagine that? Giving the Lord a hug and laying your head on his breast where you can hear his heartbeat. That's how intimate the relationship was. But yet, yet years later, when John sees him in all of his glory, he sees the revelation, right? What happened to John? fell on his face as if dead before the Lord. Yeah, so now they're seeing the Lord in all of his glory, his transfiguration. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes shined like the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. 
If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Not Moses, not Elijah, Jesus only. Hmm? And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. This was in John the Baptist. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he spoke to them concerning John the Baptist. Now, what happens shortly after that? When they come down from the mountain, they, Peter, James, and John went up to the mountain. They went up and saw the transfiguration of the Lord. They saw the glory of the Lord Jesus. But when they came down from the mountain, what was the situation with the rest of the disciples? They were being harassed by demons. There was a demonic, uh, demonically possessed boy who they could not exercise, and the demons were really mocking him, giving him a bad time. So Jesus came down with his disciples, and he exercised the demon out of the boy. So why is that a type of the rapture? What could it be seen as a type? Yeah, the three went up, up to the mountain, saw the transfigured Lord, saw the glory of the Lord, while the, the others were still down in the valley being harassed by the demons, going through the tribulation of that hour, right? Interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Go to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Paul makes an allusion to the rapture there as well. Philippians 3. Everybody there? Verse 12. You have a heading over your Bible? Pressing towards the goal. Towards the goal. What goal? Heaven. Heaven. Yeah. Paul makes it more specific then. He said the upward call. The upward call. Come up here. Who said that? To who? Jesus said that to John when he saw the apocalypse. We'll, we'll get there in a moment. Verse 12, Philippians 3. Not that I have already attained. Does anybody think they've attained? No. That's good. That's good. We never will. Not until we leave this place. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. I want, I want to accomplish all that God desires to do in my life as he is. I, can you imagine that? How many people are on the planet? Seven billion people? Currently, how many people have been on the planet since the beginning? Who knows? Why us? Out of the billions of people that have been on the planet, why did he elect us to know, to be aware, to re be recipients of his grace and his mercy, to receive the gift of salvation? when there are tens of millions, billions who would not. Wow. Wow. I want to lay hold of the purposes and the plans that Jesus has for my life for the reason why he's laid hold of me. Don't you? Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for, toward, forward towards those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the what? For the what? Wait a minute. Before it's an upward call, there's a what? 
Okay, the word in the Greek text that's interpreted prize in the English, barababan, you know what it means? An award in an athletic competition. It's a reward. Paul is talking about he's pressing on for a reward, a prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, I think that upward call is the rapture to you. I'll tell you why I think that even more, because we want to keep everything in context, right? When you interpret the scriptures, you've got to keep it in context. The verses before, the verses after. So let's see what else he says. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind, having that same mind that we want to press on towards the prize of the upward call of God. I want, I want God to be pleased with my life. And as he's pleased with my life, I want to receive whatever reward or whatever gift he may have for me. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have as them as a pattern. You know, when Hebrews talks about, it was in Hebrews, right? That multitude of witnesses, heavenly witnesses that are watching us. Are they watching us? No. no. What are those, who are those witnesses? Well, why, is it, why do they call them a myriad of witnesses? No. No, there are people who have gone before us and lived a God glorifying life. And so their lives bear witness and testimony that we can do the same. Not that they're up there bearing witness and watching us. If, if you were in heaven and you could see what's going on here on earth, heaven wouldn't be heaven. Isn't that right? No. If you could see what's going on down here, then it's not heaven anymore. <laughs> No, but we have those who have gone before us as a pattern, as a witness, as a testimony that, that if they can run this race and they can fight this good fight, we can run this race. We can fight this fight. If they can do it, I can do it. Help me, Lord. The best of men, we're all men at best. We're all men at best, right? Yeah, and that's what he's referring to here. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. Oh boy, yeah. One of the things, Jim Henry has been a pastor for uh, 60 years. Goodness, imagine that, 60 years. But he talked about the, the, the myriad of men who have fallen away. Why? Lots of reasons, you know. Lots of things that will carry you away from God's calling upon your life, the cares of this world, uh, some of the inappropriate uh, use of the church's finances, uh, sexual inappropriateness, uh, a, a number of things. And just, just, just not really truly being called. If you're called, the calling of God is irrevocable. You don't get uncalled, right? Once God calls you, you're in his service until the day he relieves you. And that's the day you go home. Hmm? But it's amazing, you know, and that's what Paul is talking about here. Those who have been enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, that God is their belly. And their glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Hey, I want to be transfigured just as Jesus was. I want to experience the rapture. That's what he's talking about. Or do you disagree? So the upward call that he's referring to here contextually in the text is the rapture. Go to Revelation chapter 3. The church that's promised an escape from the things that are coming upon the whole world. Who's that? Who's that? Philadelphia. You believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, right? Yes, no? Yes? Yes? that the rapture is going to occur before the tribulation period, pre-trib, right? One of the strongest, there are many, many, many arguments for a pre-tribulation rapture. One of the strongest arguments are the way in which revelation is constructed grammatically and in particular the use of the word church. What's the Greek word for church? Ekklesia. Ecclesia. Ecclesia is the church, but ecclesia is the word specific that's interpreted church, 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 church in the book of the Revelation. 
The word church or ecclesia is mentioned 19 times in the first three chapters of Revelation. 19 times, the church, 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 the church. 19 times. After chapter 3, it's never mentioned again until when? 20. Chapter 20, verse 16. Pay attention what the Spirit is saying to the churches. That's grammatical evidence for a pre-tribulation rapture. The church is mentioned in the first three chapters, 19 times it's here. As soon as you go into the tribulation period, God's wrath during that time, there's no mention of the church whatsoever until the very end of the tribulation in chapter 20. Isn't that amazing? But look at the text. Chapter 3 is what we're looking at. Chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, says he who is holy, he who is true. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, he who shuts and no one opens. Now, what was the key of David? I'm sorry? The treasury. The, treasury. the key of David was the keys to the wealth of the kingdom, the, wealth, the treasury of, of, the, of David's kingdom. So all of the wealth, all of the treasures, all of the blessing all of the prosperity of the kingdom were, were in the opening of that door for which Jesus has the keys. The keys to the treasury of heaven and all the blessings. For blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Right? Hallelujah. Now, he who opens and no one shuts, he who shuts and no one opens, what's that an allusion to? What Old Testament story? Noah, Noah in the ark. Who shut the door? God did. You very specifically, you read the text. He had Noah fashion the ark. Noah had to build the ark, right? According to the specifications, the uh, schematics that God gave him. But once it was built and the animals had gone in, and, and then Noah and his family went in, it was God who sealed, shut and sealed the door, didn't he? And that's what they're talking about here. Now is the day of salvation. Now. Now the door is open. But do you hear that door closing? Yeah, very soon. He who opens, no one shuts. He who shuts, and no one opens. For I know your work. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have little strength, have kept my word, and not denied my name. 20% of the church in the West today, only 20% believe that this is literally the word of God and that it should be taken literally. The Bible is literally the word of God and should be taken literally. The bibliology is the study of the Bible. And the understanding of bibliology or the study of the Bible, what do we believe about this word, about this book? that it's first of all inspired, inspired, inspired by whom? Not the 40 human authors, but the Holy Spirit had moved those human authors to write. And therefore, if it's inspired, it's also what? Infallible. And the infallibility is, means what? It means it's accurate in everything it intends to teach you, whether it's science or sociology or wh whatever the subject matter may be, the Bible is completely accurate. You'll never be found to be untrue. It's, in er it's in inspired, it's infallible, it's inerrant. inerrant. And what does that mean? It simply means that in the original language, the Hebrew and the Aramaic and the Old Testament, the Greek of the New text, it's without error, right? Therefore, because it's inspired, infallible, and inerrant, it is authoritative. authoritative. It's our authority. There's no, there's no higher authority in all the world but God's Word. It's not true because it's in the Bible, right? It's not, listen to me, it's not true because it's in the Bible. God, the Holy Spirit, put it in the Bible because it is true. You understand the difference here? Yeah. Science, science is good. I'm not, I'm not an anti-science person, but, but science has had to change their positions on many things over the years, right? Because science is not an exact truth, right? Science is a revelation, or the, excuse me, science is a speculation of men based upon observable study, right? But God's word is the truth of God revealed. It's God's revelation or God's light of truth given to us, his children, right? And it's always true. You've got to be very careful what you believe about the Bible. 20% of the church believe that this is literally the word of God and should be interpreted literally. And oh, by the way, that 20% are mostly seniors. Really.
here we are. Never thought we'd get here, did you? I always thought the Lord was coming. 1980, I expected him. <laughs> I was a much younger man then. <laughs> what does he say about this church? You have not denied my name, and you have kept my word, my word. So what does he promise them? Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie indeed. I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. What, what a comfort that is, isn't it? I only had one son, but I love my son, me boy. Did I always love what he did? No. no. I loved him when he was a good boy, and he made me happy. I loved him when he was a bad boy, and he made me sad. But I always loved him, right? Isn't it wonderful that, that our father now, because we are his children, he will always and forever love us. When we're not in obedience to him, we make him sad. When we're in obedience to him, we make him glad. But no matter which, he will not know. He will not, not love us. And he will always love you far more than you will ever love him. Isn't that wonderful? And the reality is, he wants you with him more than you want to be there. I'm sure there were times I wanted my son with me and his mother more than he wanted to be with us. <laughs> he wanted to be with us, sure. But you know, there's other things he'd like to do, too. But boy, I sure love being with him, you know? And, and God, our Father, loves being with us, his children. And he can't wait until we're all together, together with him forever. Mm. Yes, because you have kept my command to persevere. And we need to persevere. We need to endure. Listen, it's going to get harder. It's going to get tougher. You're going to see a lot of people fall by the wayside. There's going to be a great deception. They're going to believe... Uh, they're going to believe the craziness of this world. And it's getting crazy, isn't it? I mean, we can't even define what a woman is anymore or what a man is, we're going to say. How, how ridiculous. We're telling elementary school children that, that you're, you're, well, you're not really a boy, you're not really a girl. What, who do you, what do you think you are? How do you feel today? You know, I feel confused. <laughs> I feel mixed up. How do you think I should feel? <laughs> but it's insane, isn't it? And, and listen, listen to me. More people in the world today believe in aliens than they believe in God. More people in the world today have more faith and belief in aliens than they do the God of the Bible. Shocking, isn't it? Hmm? Hmm. Yes, persevere, endure. It's going to get crazy out there. You, listen, you have to be grounded. You have to be sure on where your heart is and where your head is and your belief in the word of God. John eleven twenty six. what does it say? He will give eternal life to all those who live in and believe in Jesus. Living in is with the heart. Believing in is with the head. It's both with your head and with your heart. You're all in. And you better make sure. You've got to endure. You've got to persevere. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial that shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Now, does that mean he's coming shortly? He wrote this 2,000 years ago. What does it mean, quickly? What is the word quickly? Chronos in time? No, tachos. Tacho like a tachometer? You know, you sold that fast car, didn't you, Zach? You had that Camaro? You had a tech honor. Did you have a tech in that Camaro? Determine the revolutions per minute, right? When you rev it up, you let it go, you burn some rubber. Hmm? A lot of fun, isn't it? This is the word being used here, tacos. It means when all of this begins to take place, it's going to happen so fast. The revolutions are going to be so quick that it's going to take your breath away. That's why you need to prepare now. You can't prepare when it happens. The shock is going to take so many by surprise as a thief in the night. But now is the time to prepare. Hmm? Yeah, I, behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one, no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go 
out no more, and I will write on him my new, the name of my God and the name of my, the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Everybody gets a new name. You know, God, how many times in the Bible God gave people new names? Can you name some of them? Who did he give new names to? Jacob became Israel. Abram became Sarai. Sarah. Huh? Paul. Yeah, Saul of Tarsus, Cephas, right. Do you know your new name? No, you don't know your new name? That small, still voice hasn't told you your new name? Mine is No Neck. <laughs> I don't know my new name. <laughs> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, out of the seven churches here in chapters 2 and 3, only one church is promised an escape. Why? Because they have persevered. They have endured. They have been faithful. They have kept his word. They have not denied his name. Salvation occurs under the name of Jesus only. Belief in Jesus. Living in Jesus. Hmm? John chapter, excuse me, Revelation chapter 4, also we see a type of the rapture in what happened to the apostle John. Remember that Peter, John was a young boy, probably a teenager, late teens, when he became one of the disciples of Jesus. Peter was a much older man, and, and now they're on an age, and God has revealed, Jesus has revealed to Peter how he's going to die. And then Peter's next question was what? What about the boy? He talks about, well, what about this boy? What about, this? you know, what about him? Your favorite over here. You know, nobody likes the teacher's pet, do they? <laughs> and what did Jesus say? What, what, mind your business. Mind your business, you know. It's good for us, right? Who's, whose servant am I? The Lord's servant. Whose servant are you? The Lord's servant. So, you know, I, I don't need to be consumed about what you do. I need to worry about what I do before the Lord, right? And you're the Lord's servant. You'll stand or fall before him. He'll deal with you, right? Yeah. And, and so he said, Peter, what is that to you if he should remain until I come? What is it to you? Now, what, what, what everybody believed at that point was then John wasn't going to die until Jesus came. Jesus was going to come before John died. And so they were watching John age. So they're all hoping John is today the day. Today, maybe, possibly, you know, the Lord will come the day you die. <laughs> And, and John died an old man, where? Ephesus. Ephesus, at the church in Ephesus that loved him, cared. He was the only one that wasn't martyred, interestingly enough. There's a reason for that, too. But John died an old man of old age. But did G John see the coming of Jesus? Yes, he did. On the Isle of Patmos, God gave him an understanding of the vision. Oh, it's 821 already, okay. He gave him a vision of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it begins here in chapter... 4 verse 1 and John says after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I heard was like what a trumpet speaking with me saying what come up here the upward call come up here John come up here Paul come up here church come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this after what after the things of chapters 2 and 3. What are the things of chapters 2 and 3 that are going to take place after chapter 2 and 3? What was chapter 2 and 3? The church age. The church age. The church age. Ecclesia, the church. How many times is it mentioned in those chapters? 19 times. 19 times the church is never mentioned again until you get to the end of the tribulation in chapter 20, verse 16. Then he mentions the church again. So the revelation, the book of the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ can be broken down very neatly. The things that were, the things that are, the things that shall be, right? Who was, who is, who is to come. Chapter 1, things that were. Chapters 2 and 3, things that are. Chapters 4, the rest of the book, the things that are coming. The tribulation period. But after these things, after the church age, after the rapture of the church, he was referring to there. Uh, let's see. Go to chapter 22 of the Revelation. <clears throat> well, in verse 3, chapter 3, uh, in, in chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus likens his coming as to what? A thief in the night. 
in, in uh, chapter 16, verse 15, what does he say there? Jesus is speaking in chapter 16, verse 15. What does he say? Behold, I am coming as a thief. The blessed is he who watches. There's these warnings over and over and over again to be watchful, to be ready, to be prepared. Look at chapter 22. Verse 7, what does he say? Behold, I am quickly, quickly, blessed is he who keeps the words of, this, of the prophecy of this book. Again, quickly, when it begins to happen, it's going to happen so fast, so quickly, it's going to take your breath away. I think Pastor David mentioned uh, a week before, uh, a week previous on his Sunday message that he couldn't believe how fast things have changed in the last few years. Yeah. And we're, it's going to take our breath away to see the changes that are coming as, as the spirit of the age is taking hold of this planet and is so deceived the minds of so many people. You see, if you really want to try to understand what's happening, it's the craziness of our time. You have to step back and look at it from a spiritual perspective. They're in the sway of the evil one. God's given them over to a reprobate mind. And, and that's precisely what's that. They can't even think straight. Highly educated people are morons. But here, verse 7, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. Uh, look at verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, suddenly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, and the end, the first and the last. Verse 16, in particular now, the, the next time and the last time the church is mentioned, right? Since, verse, since chapter 3. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to signify to you these things in the churches, ecclesia, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Verse 20, he who testifies of these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Beware, be ready, be watching. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. Revelation, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Peter. 1st Peter 4. Everybody there? Verse 7. 1 Peter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Is that true? If, I mean, if Peter thought it then, it's surely true now, isn't it? And we see so many signs that Jesus gave us to look for that have come together that really indicate the end of all things is at hand. The study of eschatology is the study of end times, the end of life as we know it here. Now, he said, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be, be serious. Be watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. And what we need to ask God for is that love to love our enemies. Well, it's easy to love our friends. Isn't it? I love this church. I love you. The speaker was talking about all, it was, it was all pastors at the retreat I went to because it was a pastor's renewal. These, those people are so wonderful. They invite you up there and in the free lodging, free food, free conference because they want to help encourage pastors. But he was saying how many things you, you are without over the next three days and you can be uh, relieved of the stresses. And then he said, and your congregation isn't here. <laughs> and several of the Several, unfortunately, some of the fellows went, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't feel that way. We don't feel that way at all. You're, you're easy to love, you know? Yeah, I mean, truly, you know, you're just, it's so easy for me to love you. I got to work on loving my enemies. You know, I got to work on, you know, they, they said, how do you feel about that? Free lodging, free food, free conference? Makes me feel like a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> Where was I? Seven and eight, okay. The end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious and be watchful in your prayers, and above all things put on fervent love one for another, for love will cover a multitude of our sins. Praise the Lord. Look at Second Peter. Second Peter 3. Second 
2 Peter chapter 3. We'll end here. I have a few more, but we won't do that tonight. Now, next week, we do what? Communion. Communion. Communion, the most worshipful thing we do. We come to the Lord and confess our shortcomings and ask him to strengthen us and renew us so we can live for his glory even more, right? So be prepared for communion next week. And then the following week, we will begin our study through the book of Ezekiel. That's right. That's the book we're going to next, Ezekiel. Very colorful book. But here, we're in chapter 3 of 2 Peter, verse 8. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will so come as a what? Thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with a fer excuse me, a fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you ought you to be in holy conduct? in Christ's likeness, godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church. It ends at the end of the millennial reign when all of this will take place. The big bang is not in the beginning. It's at the end. end. <laughs> But as we've been looking, now listen. Do you understand God's admonition over and over and over and over, the warning for you and I to be serious about our walk with Jesus, to be ready? You, you can't, listen, you can't be playing fast and loose with your salvation and, and think that you're ready. You won't be. And for those that we love who are, you need to, you need to warn them lovingly with tears. Warn them. Warn them. We, we don't want anybody to be caught unaware, do we? And we surely don't want to be caught unaware. And, and what harm is it going to do us to be as close to the Lord as we possibly can be until that day? What harm will that do us? None. None whatsoever. But what harm would it bring us if we start to become very worldly, allow the cares of this world or the deceitfulness of riches, riches or the lust of the flesh to take hold of our life. Even in our little fellowship, we watch people come in so excited about the Lord, you know, but, but, but I, I've, I've been pastoring for 31 years. I've been saved over 40 years, and I've seen many sparkler Christians. I call them sparklers. You know sparklers, right? You light a sparkler? Whee! And after a few minutes, you pick up the sparkler. It's cold. There's no more light. There's no more heat. There's no more joy. There's no more pleasure. There's no more sparkle. Right? And I, I, th I can think of people now that hurt my heart, who, who, who were here among us. They were light. They were sparkle. They were joy. But they're not here anymore. And, and, and let me tell you, so let me tell you, more and more and more are going to fall away because of the pressures that are being put on the church to conform to this world. Look at the number of evangelical leaders who are conforming to the wokeness of today. It's astounding. It's amazing. We are called to endure. We're called to be watchful, to be serious. As your pastor, I just want to continue to warn you. And myself, I'm warning myself as I warn you. We need to be so serious about our relationship with the Lord. Cultivate that relationship. Do more this right now. Purpose to do more this year than you ever have before in cultivating that own spiritual person that you are. In your study of the word, in your prayer time, in your singing praises to the Lord from the heart. All of it motivated from the heart. And watch how your life will change. And God will give us that hypostasis. That's the year. What was, that was the word for this year, right? What was the word? confidence. God will give us that hypostasis, that confidence of knowing that when he comes, I'm gone. And so are you. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. Shall we stand?